So, um, hello everyone. Um, the first thing I can't skip doing just because I've, I've been doing this a few times already on, on, on Zoom since the beginning of COVID, but we've had a few global conversations such as these, but this part doesn't get old. So I just love saying it. So good morning uh, to participants on the American West Coast. Good afternoon to participants on the East Coast. Uh, good evening in Europe and good night here in Israel and Palestine and everywhere uh, further to the East. Uh, welcome to this conversation of Learning for Peace. Learning for Peace is an initiative by the Combatants for Peace movement where we attempt to broaden our knowledge base in order to improve our work and to promote uh, peace and the end of the occupation. Before we get started, I want to just do a few quick technicalities. Uh, first is to say that this session is being recorded and could be published later, either on Facebook or YouTube or both. Uh, mostly you would only be seen if you speak, and that's how your uh, image would pop up into the uh, shared screen, but please know that your image could be uh, uh, shared more broadly uh, by continuing to participate in the session today. Second, I will say this in Hebrew, it has to do with Hebrew interpretation, as this session will be in English. Okay, so I don't have work today. <laughs> okay, so no simultaneous translation. Um, the third technicality, when, whenever we have a physical event, uh, if, if there was no COVID, we'd be meeting somewhere and having guest uh, uh, speakers, we'd be passing around a, uh, a little contact sheet where everyone is welcome to uh, uh, leave their information so that we can be in touch about future events and activities. Um, so we're now we're doing the virtual version of that. So over chat, there is our online forum, which is basically that same piece of paper. So um, we invite you to take a moment while we're talking and uh, fill out the form if you'd like to stay in touch. So in this panel this evening, we'd like to learn from the experiences of the climate movement and the environmental community, uh, both to explore the co commonalities between the peace uh, between peace and environmental work and to learn about tools, strategies, and tactics that the climate movement employs and hopefully gain inspiration and insight to improve the work of our peace movement here in Israel and Palestine. My name is Yonatan Gale. I'm the executive director of Combatants for Peace. Um, I'm a former uh, executive director of Greenpeace Mediterranean, so I'm well within uh, uh, both areas of, uh, of knowledge for uh, tonight, but I'll give the environmental platform to our participants. Uh, so I'll be the facilitator for this evening and I'm honored to introduce our speakers. Uh, request to the panelists, please have your microphones open and say hi when I say your name so that your picture pops up for everyone to see. Our first guest is uh, Liam Giri Blau. Uh, Bal, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Liam uh, helped launch Extin Extinction Rebellion and has since worked across uh, uh, many parts of the movement focusing on the creative design of mass civil disobedience. Welcome, Liam. Hi again. Good to be with you. Gidon Broomberg, who I personally have been working with since the early 2000s. Uh, he's the co-founder and 25-year Israeli director of EcoPeace Middle East. Hello. And Yara is one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion here in Israel, Hamered Behakhada. She works for Green Course, Megamai Ruka, uh, a student environmental organization as a climate campaigner, uh, where she works with the youth framework uh, Strike for Future Israel. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. So before we get started, just one quick thing to all participants. The first part of this evening is going to be a conversation that we run with the panelists. If you have a, a question that you'd like to work in uh, relevant to whatever we're talking at, uh, about at that moment uh, or a follow up to something you just heard, uh, please write it over chat and we'll see if we can uh, work it in. There will be a whole second part of uh, the conversation tonight, which is an open Q&A where anyone can ask any question at all. 
Um, so that's generally our uh, structure for tonight. Uh, so let's start with getting to know our panelists. Um, I'd like uh, each of you to please take a few minutes and just tell us a little bit about yourselves, your background, and why you do what you do. Liam. Hello. Yeah, so my name's Liam. Uh, I'm from London in England. Uh, it's really good to be with you all here tonight. Um, and I guess my journey into activism really was through the anti-war movement that was kind of going on when I was a teenager um, in the UK. And through that got involved in direct action around stopping um, Britain's involvement in fueling conflict around the world. So that meant direct action against the arms trade here in the UK. Um, and it was there really that I kind of figured out that making our protests fun, even when they were about something ex deadly serious, um, was a really important way to motivate people to keep involved and keep interested. Um, and also a way with a small group of people that we could get the media to focus on such an important issue. Um, uh, around the time of the climate summit in Paris, COP21, and the build up to that, um, I kind of realized that I really needed to focus on um, what was going on with the environment. And I kind of decided to focus all my work there, both my practice as an artist um, and my practice as an activist and organizer. Um, so I really moved my focus there because, you know, I, why keep fighting for a better future for our society when, you know, we will have no future was really what drove me, I guess, to shift my focus there. Um, so one of the first projects I did as an artist was um, a project cheerleading against climate change. Um, so I got groups of people together to come up with um, creative, catchy chants that would mean that, you know, even if I only had someone's attention for five seconds, I'd get them thinking about climate change. That was really my aim. And it turned out the chants were so catchy. And again, using creativity in there, um, they really stuck in people's heads and people carried on thinking about sea level rising. Um, and then I wanted to focus on where I'm from in London and how it really impacted people there. So I thought maybe focusing on air pollution that kills over 9,000 people a year in London would be a way to engage people in something that often seems like far away for people, for people in um, Western countries. So that's how I ended up meeting um, a group of people called Rising Up who had a campaign called Stop Killing Londoners where they were not only using creativity, um, they also were using nonviolent civil disobedience and risking being arrested. Um, and so even with a small group of people, suddenly this issue became um, newsworthy because people were actually willing to be arrested. They were showing the severity of the issue by the severity of their actions. And so Extinction Rebellion really was a continuation of that experiment, but how can we broaden out that experiment to talk about the whole climate and ecological emergency that we're facing right now? And how can we broaden out so that it's a mass movement of nonviolence or disobedience? So really the experiment here was how can we design actions that anyone can participate in? So whether that's um, young people, whether that's families with small children, whether that's grandmothers, whether that's um, students or people who are still at work, how can we design an action that all these people can be involved in? Um, and is different from the stuff that we'd seen in the environmental movement in the last 10, 20 years. So rather than the small groups of highly trained people going off to offshore drill sites um, and disrupting them, or groups of local people dealing with the frontline stuff of extractivism in their community. This was, how can, we, how can we get a mass lot of people involved who can do something really simple and bring it to the heart of government, to, the, to where the power is and where the media is and do something disruptive that they can't ignore anymore. And so within um, a few months of launching really, we, we began to spread around the globe and we've now seen Extinction Rebellion groups and actions happen in, I think, over 70 countries now, um, something like that. And as um, Jonathan said, I've mostly been focusing on the mass 
civil disobedience actions in the UK. So that's mostly the perspective I'll be talking from is obviously my own. We're a mass movement and so no one can speak for all of us. There's a whole range of opinions in the group and that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Gida? So, so firstly, thank you for the invitation um, uh, to speak. Um, uh, I think uh, you know, the work of Combatants for Peace is, is extremely important and I'm a supporter. Um, uh, so I am uh, I'm a lawyer by training and I uh, received a, a scholarship to do a, a master's uh, in international environmental law uh, in Washington DC through the New Israel Fund and uh, was there uh, during the 93-94 uh, uh, Oslo negotiations and uh, peace treaty uh, and negotiations between Israel and Jordan and chose a research uh, question um, given my prior work on, on environmental issues in Israel um, uh, asking whether uh, uh, peace was going to be good for the environment um, and my research concluded that uh, uh, there was massive overdevelopment being proposed um, uh, the, the, the euphoria of peace was going to see uh, massive overdevelopment. Some 50,000 new hotels, for instance, were being proposed to be built around uh, the Dead Sea. And um, uh, one, the conclusion of my thesis was that uh, uh, peace, ironically, uh, could lead to further destruction of the, uh, of the shared environment. And that uh, one of the recommendations of the thesis was that, well, perhaps if Israelis and Palestinians and Jordanians and Egyptians could come together and establish a, uh, a civil society organization, perhaps we could uh, make sure that uh, peace would not only uh, lead to peace between people, but also uh, between people and our shared environment. Um, and uh, uh, several months after coming back uh, from my studies, um, uh, I organized the very first meeting ever of uh, Egyptian, Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israeli environmentalists that on the second day of that meeting led to the creation of Equipeace. And at that time, uh, 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 the name Equipeace was mostly echo. We were mostly focused on ecology. We were mostly, because um, uh, uh, peace was a given in, in uh, 94, 95. We were all certain that you know, in, in, in this moment of euphoria, um, that uh, uh, peace had broken out and our role was to make sure that uh, it would also lead uh, to peace with nature, um, that it wouldn't be destructive. But clearly, as we all know, um, uh, peace did not break out. And the mission of Ecopeace has changed um, over uh, these two and a half decades, these 25 years. And today, I think we're much more reflective of our name of, of ecology and peace. And um, uh, we're, uh, I think, a flagship uh, organization for a concept called environmental uh, peace building. Um, uh, uh, we, we, in fact, are often quoted uh, by academic literature as, uh, as one of the, perhaps the first organization that actually uh, started to implement an environmental peace building agenda. We didn't know that. It wasn't, that concept wasn't there uh, uh, back in, uh, uh, in 94, uh, but basically um, uh, the rationale behind our work today is that uh, uh, the environment as an issue of common concern, I mean, the environment as an issue, um, uh, certainly in our tiny part of the world uh, where uh, man-made human uh, resort, uh, borders are meaningless, um, uh, where uh, the, the, the real uh, borders that matter when it comes to uh, our broader livelihood issues, our broader environmental issues, are our watershed uh, borders, are uh, the borders of, uh, of, of, of diversity, um, uh, of plant diversity and so forth, um, uh, geological borders um, are far more significant. Um, uh, and uh, at Ecopeace, we use uh, uh, the, the, the common threat uh, to our shared environment as a means to promote an understanding that cooperation um, is a necessity, 
um, uh, that cooperation is, 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 is not a privilege, um, that uh, 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 our very future on uh, this, this region that we claim to, uh, to love um, is very much dependent on our ability to, uh, to work together and manage those uh, resources together. And within that concept, um, uh, 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 there is a, a very clear understanding that we're never going to manage those resources together unless they're shared uh, with a sense of fairness uh, between our different peoples, first and foremost Israelis and Palestinians, but also more broadly um, uh, with others in the region and particularly Jordan, um, but also not only um, uh, between people. So you know, the Geneva Initiative had asked Equipeace uh, to author, as an example, um, uh, the uh, water uh, chapter of the Geneva peace process. Um, what would water, what would peace look like in a water setting? And the Geneva Initiative actually rejected um, uh, the uh, water accord that Ecopeace had produced because it was seen as too complicated. Um, because, you know, uh, other experts were saying, well, you know, let's just divide uh, the water between Israelis and Palestinians. In Ecopeace, we were saying no. I mean, there's, there's more than two people um, uh, here to, uh, that are, are dependent on those water resources. Nature is a critical player. In fact, it's the very foundation of the lives of Israelis and Palestinians together. And therefore, uh, the needs of nature must also be met. So um, uh, it's an example of, of, of how we take uh, the environment issue and uh, uh, broaden uh, the discussion um, to not only uh, a survival issue for ourselves, but a survival issue for you know the the, the very nature that that allows our survival to take place. Um, and so so you know uh, the work of Echo Peace. Um, uh, if someone is there's a microphone uh, uh, open there. Um, uh, the, the work of Echo Peace is is today. Um, uh, uh, focused uh, on two complementary uh, paths. Half of our programming is community-based. Um, uh, we're, we're working in Israeli, Palestinian, Jordanian communities on all sides of shared water bodies, we're working in schools, we're working with uh, local activists, we work with uh, uh, mayors and local community leaders, we work with religious uh, uh, leaders, rabbis, imams, and, and priests. Um, that's our bottom-up efforts. And, and then uh, that's complemented by top-down advocacy. Um, so we produce reports uh, on the Jordan River, on the Dead Sea, um, uh, on, on the climate crisis, um, uh, where uniquely we'll bring an Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian uh, expert to write it together. So we have some common fact-finding and then uh, come out with conclusions that then uh, the Israeli office will advocate in Hebrew vis-a-vis -vis Israeli decision makers, uh, the Palestinian office um, uh, in Arabic to Palestinian decision makers, uh, the Jordanian office in Arabic to Jordanian uh, decision makers, and together uh, the three officers, the three directors to the international community. And we, we've really found that that synergy of bottom up and, and top down um, has been extremely effective. And uh, I, I, I'm sure I'm gonna get the chance, I hope I'm gonna get the chance to speak to some of the changes because uh, I think you're interested in, in the strategies. And I, I think the strategies that, that we've, um, we've developed have been extremely effective in changing uh, uh, policies of governments on the ground uh, in, including even stopping the wall from being built um, uh, between Israel and Palestine in, in, in one particular section, but, but in also uh, uh, changing the narrative um, uh, or, or expanding the narrative, and, and, and particularly from a, a narrow military security perspective to a broader human security perspective. Thanks, Thank Gideon. Yara? Um, so thank you again for, for inviting me to participate here. It's very nice to see so many people interested in this subject. Um, so I never planned on being an activist. I dreamed 
to be a singer when I was young. And, but then at the age of 14, I saw the movie An Inconvenient Truth. And of course, there are better movies that are made today, more accurate and more up to date. But that movie really shook me. It like turned my whole life upside down. And I mainly felt anger and uh, frustrated that I did not know about these issues. And I did not know how much destruction humans are causing the planet and to ourselves. And mostly I was very frustrated that I didn't, didn't do anything about it. So from that point, it was very hard for me to let go of the environmental issue or not think about it and not do anything. So I started from small, small things like um, getting my family to um, recycle and uh, individual uh, things that you do to, on your day to day. But, and I only became an activist when I started going to the university in Be'er Sheva. Um, I actually started in Greenpeace. I don't know if you were the CEO back then, but um, uh, very fast I got to Green Course. I started being active in Green Course on the first campaign that really got me to be more, uh, I think, radicalize me and politicize me was fighting against the government's plan to build new uh, Jewish uh, suburbs or se settlements in the Negev area. Um, this would cause a lot of damage to, first of all, existing uh, Bedouin villages that were there and also um, open spaces, open natural spaces and existing cities that needed the government's support to strengthen themselves and not have their strong communities leave them for these new settlements. So that was the first campaign I got involved in. And after that, I started working for Green Course, which is an environmental grassroots organization that does mainly uh, community organizing work and helps community push for public campaigns mm -hmm. to influence policymakers. Um, and I started being, being more like during this time when I was working for Green Course, I felt all this time that the environmental movement in Israel knows very well how to do lobby work and knows how to do planning and, and legislation work, but there is a very, there's a lack of nonviolent direct action and there's a lack of the ability to be more upfront with the um, injustices that we fight against. Um, so when I went to Poland two years ago in I visited, I went to the uh, COP24, the climate convention, and um, I was exposed to a lot of the environmental and climate activists from all over Europe. And I actually saw Liam standing on a stage and telling everyone there in a march that they are going, they are in this new organization called Extinction Rebellion and that they are going to hold this uh, international rebellion in April and we should all join them. And for me, I was like, oh yeah. Um, so when we got back, a few of, of us Israelis, I don't know if Liam, you remember this, but um, when we got back to Israel, a bunch of us Israelis that were there, we decided, okay, we should start an action group and start doing direct action and try to inspire more people in Israel to show them that it is possible to do these type of actions. And this is the time we have no time to waste on regular campaigning. And this is what I've been doing for the past three years. And, and then from, from that, we started an action group that then became Extinction Rebellion in Israel, the branch in Israel. Um, and I think I'll tell more about that later, but for me, it was a very important time in my life that I, I understood that what I've been doing all this time needs to, I need to take it up an, another step, like I did when I was young, from recycling to doing more protests or lobby work, then now it was a time for me to put my body on the line for this big crisis that we're dealing with. Um, and I'm happy to say that a lot of people in Israel felt the same. Um, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Yara. So back when I first joined Greenpeace in the early 2000s, and we started for the first time for Greenpeace, working on climate in 
Israel, until then it was more about pollution in the Mediterranean Sea and so on, we would go out to the street and, and most Israelis would say, but didn't we just fix the ozone layer problem? Why, why are we talking about this again? So there was a lot still to do. Um, and we covered a lot of distance since, and most people generally know the issue. But for the purpose of this conversation, uh, Liam, if you could get us all on the same page, um, well, just if you could talk us through the issue itself, uh, uh, the climate emergency, where we are, um, what will happen if we don't do anything as uh, uh, humankind, what does the world need to do at this point? And then if you could just talk a little bit about Extinction Rebellion and how that fits in. Uh, yeah, so um, disclaimer, as I said earlier, I'm an artist. I'm not an environmental scientist. Um, I'm also a, a direct action organizer. And I think one of the things that Extinction Rebellion did just in some of its messaging and creativity, even in its name, was let's face the fact that we're in the sixth mass extinction. In the whole history of the world, there has been you know, five of these mass extinction events before. The one that's famous is the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, right? Right now, we're in the sixth mass extinction. So we wanted to put that front and center. And we also wanted to, you know, organize this mass nonviolent um, civil disobedience movement, right? So nonviolence was really at the heart of it. And it was proactive approach to nonviolence rather than just passive. And so that really meant mobilizing around gr first grief for the extinction event that we're in right now, and then mobilizing around love because this is actually going to affect every single person now and in future generations. And so rather than so many groups on the left and right want to mobilize around hate and division um, and actively against something, we were really trying to proactively be nonviolent in all of our messaging. And so that's where the name came from, Extinction Rebellion. So really my summary of where we're at right now is that, you know, despite the whole coronavirus pandemic going on right now and, you know, so many other issues which are so important coming to the fore right now, like racism, you know, on climate and ecological emergency, we're still fucked. This was the first banner that Extinction Rebellion dropped in London. We said climate change, we're fucked. And it's still the case. Governments have still failed to take this seriously at all. You know, carbon emissions have continued to rise despite the best efforts of the environmental movements over the last 20, 30 years. And we still, as Greta Thunberg continually says, needs to bring that curve down drastically. So Extinction Rebellion set out with these impossible demands. People said it's not possible. We've asked the government and the media and the education system to tell the truth on the emergency. Um, and then we've asked them to act now to halt biodiversity loss and to bring down carbon emissions to net zero by 2025. People say that it's impossible, but with Extinction Rebellion, we wanted to shift really what the public thought was possible, like um, Jonathan just described about how Greenpeace had a lot of work to say, no, this is still actually an issue. We wanted to shift from oh, climate change is something that individuals should be doing something about, or it's on, on the back burner to actually say, no, this is something that needs drastic political action from everyone now. Um, and so I don't know if that kind of covers where we're at now on the, on, the, on the scientific end of it, but Extinction Rebellion kind of took that science and taught it all around the UK. So before we did any kind of civil disobedience, we actually went and spoke to people. We didn't just post about this on Twitter or Facebook. We actually went to communities, to church halls, to synagogues, to universities, um, into, you know, anywhere we could find people who wanted to hear about the extinction that was going on. And we first talked to them about mass extinction. We asked them to face that and grieve about it. And then we talked to them about nonviolent civil disobedience throughout history. What Extinction Rebellion set up is nothing new. It's just ideas that we've borrowed from movements who've tried valiantly over the last hundred years to change things. And some of them have succeeded. We've borrowed those tactics. We talked to people about them and said, you know, are you willing to move through that grief into action? And a phrase that we used around the beginning was when hope dies, actions begin. So we really wanted people to face how bad it was and then go through that and, and take action. And we knew not everyone would, 
but we also knew from the history of other civil disobedience movements that we only needed about 3% of the UK population to take some kind of action around this issue and be involved. So that's what we set out to do. And then once we launched, we saw that this kind of momentum driven um, organizing take place where by do, ha having people do an action and take the risk, the, the people who had the privilege to take the risk to be arrested were arrested and that then encouraged other people to say, wow, these people are taking some kind of sacrifice here. This must be really serious. So our actions showed people that, the, you know, they were in line with saying, if, if we're saying this is an emergency, we need to take some kind of serious action. And so that then began to snowball and more and more groups formed around the UK um, until we saw what last year were the largest acts of non-violent civil disobedience that the UK has seen um, in the last 50 years at least, possibly the last 100 years. Um, and obviously all of this was happening at the same time as things like the school strike movements, which means that now in the UK, concern for the climate is at highest ever on record after these actions. So it's really showing how these disruptive tactics um, and forcing people to face this as an emotional issue rather than just being presented with the facts all the time. Actually, if you're presented with the emotional issue of, oh, my day is being disrupted, I can't get on, on the tube today, I can't get my bus today, I'm gonna have to consider why these people are doing it. And some people are turned off us, but they still are turned onto the issue. And that's the more important thing that more and more of the public understand that this is an emergency now, rather than that they all necessarily fall in line with our tactics. Thanks, Liam. And about the science of it, yeah, I think you covered it. If we don't do take radical action now, we're fucked, I think sums it up uh, very precisely. Uh, within that, one of the frustrating things, that, in my perspective, in, in trying to do something about this in Israel, and this is a question to Gidon and, and Diara, so Israel is by no means one of the main uh, global CO2 emitters. And in fact, its share is roughly 0.18%. How do each of you very briefly see what Israelis can and should be doing in the context of the climate emergency? Uh, Gidon? Sure. So um, we uh, have a whole program uh, focused on uh, the climate crisis. And of course, in a typical Ecopeace fashion, it's a regional focus. And you know, so this is an issue of common threat um, uh, to all three uh, peoples that, that we're focused on in, in Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. And, and we, we really try to, um, we've done uh, the research on the one hand, where uh, we've looked at uh, the science and, and how the impact of uh, the climate crisis uh, will impact the uh, the viability of living in our region. So, you know, while the rest of the world is worried about a, a one and a half to two degree increase in temperature, we're already experiencing a two degree increase in temperature. We're worried about a four degree increase in temperature. Um, in fact, uh, for parts of Jordan, you know, the the models speak about uh, uh, Jordan and then further east. Uh, towards the Gulf, um, where life becomes unlivable, uh, where during the summer, um, long summer months, uh, people can no longer spend more than five minutes outside uh, because it's going to be too hot uh, for the body uh, 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 to, to sustain that. Um, uh, we've uh, witnessed, uh, apart from these past two years where, where there was good uh, rain, um, uh, you know, prior to that, in the last 20 years, there was 15 years of drought. Uh, again, the science uh, is showing us that uh, the most water scarce part of the world, we are the most water scarce part of the world, will become even more water scarce. And um, uh, then, so, so then we take the science and then we try to apply that science to well, what's happening on the ground. Um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, we uh, have uh, in our work, uh, in Jordan, we highlight the refugee crisis um, uh, that has hit Jordan um, uh, with some 2 million Syrian refugees uh, crossing from Syria to Jordan. Um, that uh, uprising in, in Syria 
being related to the climate crisis, being related to consecutive years of drought. We have a Syrian participant here who's shaking her, who's nodding her head. Um, uh, uh, that 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 uh, uh, the failure of the Assad uh, regime to respond to that crisis, which which leaves hundreds of thousands of Syrian farmers to leave with their families, which becomes millions, um, to the cities where the uprising takes place. Um, but the, but the, uh, the result doesn't just stop in Syria. It spreads over to Jordan, it spreads over to Lebanon, it spreads over uh, to Turkey. Um, uh, 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 very few people, certainly in Israel, uh, understand that the ramifications is that Amman, you know, the capital of Jordan, over 4 million people, used to get water two days a week, never 24 seven, like in Israel. But with an, an additional 2 million refugees, Amman today gets water for just eight hours a week. And that's a threat to Jordan's uh, survival. That's a threat to, to national security in Jordan. Um, through, the, through the climate uh, crisis, we, we, uh, we try to highlight that we're all in the same boat, that instability, uh, uh, in Jordan will lead to instability in Palestine and Israel. Um, uh, that that uh, uh, like the refugee crisis led, has led already to instability in Jordan, the further impacts of climate change um, uh, will, uh, will, will further uh, uh, impact stability in, 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 our, uh, in our countries as well. Um, one of the, one of the um, though it's not related to, to climate change, one of the strongest um, uh, arguments that, that, that we've brought forward um, is the crisis of water and sanitation in Gaza, um, uh, where uh, 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 mostly related to the fact that two million people have only been able to pump water from uh, the aquifer underneath their feet, and therefore they've been over pumping. Um, to, to a degree that 97% of the aquifer is no longer potable in Gaza. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and much due to uh, the closure um, and, and the uh, disengagement, uh, so-called disengagement policies of the government of Israel, um, uh, we've seen uh, 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 infrastructure or, or the ability to bring infrastructure into Gaza um, uh, 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 completely diminished um, if, if it's considered some sort of dual use uh, item. So uh, for uh, close to a decade, bringing cement into Gaza was extremely uh, difficult. Um, uh, uh, indeed, Hamas was stealing cement in order to build tunnels to attack Israel. Um, but the message that we brought home was that by not allowing cement to go into Gaza, it means that sewage treatment plants can't be built in Gaza. And if sewage treatment plants are not built in Gaza, then the crisis of water is also a crisis of sanitation. So it further pollutes the little water that's there, uh, but also that that uh, 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 sewage flows into the Mediterranean and is carried uh, by the currents every day, not only to the beaches of Gaza, but also to the beaches of Israel. And um, uh, here we, uh, uh, while doing uh, testing of the beaches in Israel, looking for p potentially for pandemic disease, because um, with 30% uh, of disease in Gaza uh, uh, due to unhealthy water, and we were looking for cholera or polio or, or other pandemics uh, on the beaches of Israel. And, and we, 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 uh, we thought that if we highlight uh, the risk to Israeli public health from the measures of not allowing cement to go into Gaza by the closure of Gaza, that would help change uh, the policies of the government of Israel. Now, thankfully, we didn't discover um, uh, uh, a pandemic disease, um, but we were fortunate that the laboratory uh, we utilized, we turned to, happened to be the laboratory of one of Israel's desalination plants in Ashkelon, seven kilometers north of Gaza. And they told us, well, no, the good news is that um, uh, uh, we didn't find uh, uh, pandemics from the sewerage of Gaza on Israeli beaches, but do you know that Ashkelon is closed? Um, uh, Ashkelon desalination plant on its own produces 15% of Israel's drinking water. 
um, and that was kept secret. And we disclosed that information to the Israeli public uh, through the media and in a typical echo piece fashion, not in a blame uh, uh, way, but in a take responsibility way, we highlighted that uh, you can't disengage, that you know, politicians are telling us that you know, we can disengage from each other, we can build walls and fences and throw away the key. Well, we can't do that. And the environment teaches that. And by bringing home the message that Israel's water security was at stake, was um, uh, that, that there was fear of pandemic disease. And we spoke about pandemic disease before COVID um, uh, four or five years ago. Um, we were able to get all of the mayors on the Israeli side of Gaza, on, on the envelope around Gaza, to write a letter, uh, to join us in writing a letter to the Prime Minister of Israel and to the Minister of Defense, saying that um, uh, we want the cement to go in, not out of generosity to Gaza, unfortunately, but out of identifying um, uh, some very clear self-interest that, that without cement, um, uh, uh, their lives are at risk. And uh, they, you know, as they wrote in this letter, they've been at the front line of rockets and they've been the front line of tunnels. They don't want to be at the front line of pandemic disease. The policies of the Gideon, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we have a whole, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, we answered with, a few of my future questions. So I want to make sure we stay on topic. Sure, but, but, but the bottom line is that cement was removed as a, a dual use item and um, you know, if uh, uh, just, you know, uh, three, four years ago, there was no modern sewage treatment plant in Gaza. Today, there are three modern sewage treatment plants. The situation of water and sanitation is far from adequate. But, but we, we, we see a very important change in policies. That's fantastic. Yara, very briefly, the question is, what can Israelis do to affect change in the context of the global climate emergency? Uh, okay, well, briefly, it would be hard because I disagree with the framing of the fact that Israel is only 0 0.2 uh, blah, blah, blah. I, when we talk that way, we don't take into account the way that Israel um, is part of locking the whole world into fossil gas, and that is a fossil fuel. And Israel is like... All of the Israeli policy right now regarding energy is pushing us into gas. And there was, I think what Israelis can do is first of all, understand that we need to refer, um, reframe the concept of gas and not talk about natural gas, but talk about fossil gas, because we, if we, if we look at how much methane, which is a, as a gas that goes into the atmosphere and warms our planet, how much of that is causing, is, um, helping create more global warming. And like Gidon said, we're living in a, in a hot spot. The Middle East is a hot spot, then we can't, we don't have the privilege not to fight against this. And if we know that the Israeli government is pushing gas so much and is part of uh, massive projects together with the European Union and the United States on exporting gas to Europe, because Europe doesn't want any connections with Russia and all these other political um, interests, then we know that we have a responsibility to stop these projects because they, they are, are helping warm our planet even more and they are affecting our lives. So we have a big, big, big part. Maybe that's someone just what I'm saying. <laughs> the Ministry of Energy infiltrated and... <laughs> They're protesting that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that if we open our eyes and see that the Ministry of Energy and gas companies have done a very good job in campaigning natural gas as a green, clean energy, uh, so we have a responsibility to talk different about this and then stop these projects. Um, that is briefly on that. Also, because we're living in a region that is a hotspot, there is no way we can survive without working together with our neighbors. So peace has to be a part of this. Cooperation has to be a part of this. Um, it, I think there are some uh, projects and Gidon would probably know to say about this more together with some of our neighbors, but it's not enough. We, we are surrounded 
we have surrounded ourselves with neighbors that are not our friends, unfortunately, because of our political policy. So that is something that has to change. And there, there is no way that we could survive here um, in a climate emergency without having peace with our neighbors. Because it doesn't matter that we will have this green, amazing country and our neighbors, neighbors would, would have a lack of resources. They would need our help and we would have to help them. That is our human uh, basic, um, uh, I forgot the word. Um, not, yeah. Um, so it's not just an environmental issue, it's a moral issue. And I think Israelis could also look into their consumption because consumption is a big part of how of the how the modern way of life is destroying our planet. It's a big part of that. And um, we could look at what we eat. Israelis are one of the top uh, meat, con um, meat consum consumers in the world, even though we are the vegan nation. So that that I think that's another myth that we need to break and understand that the meat industry is causing is, is a big part of global warming and the climate emergency and ecolo ecological emergency and also human rights issues. Um, so we need to look at our consumption, we need to look at our energy policy and, and accept the fact that we need to change. And it's okay to change because that's what need, needs to be done. And we are, again, we are living in a hot spot. So we don't have the privilege not to make these changes. Thanks, Yara. So we talked about the issue, and I want to talk a little bit about how we affect change. This is where we're going to try to start uh, uh, learning about uh, uh, learning from you, how you do what you do. So to the onlooker, activism in general and environmental activism in particular looks quite random and chaotic. Uh, Greenpeace ship does something badass or uh, masses take to the street, but of course it is much more thought out than that. Uh, uh, Liam, you take us through how Extinction Rebellion plans and strategizes what ends up being what we see as a public as just an activity or an action on the street. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I think, I think there's kind of an issue. I mean, now Extinction Rebellion's expanded in this way and anyone, as long as they stick to our principles and values, can go out into the street and take action, right, and use our name. Um, you don't have to like sign up or like get instructions from someone. So in that way, that means that now there's so many, there is so many different actions happening under our name and that's amazing to see it spread so quickly. Um, but I guess particularly around the beginning and still kind of the core strategy of the kind of actions that we, that we did in the UK here, um, there's kind of two main actions that I'd say that you can put our actions into two categories. One is these kind of what I'd call these kind of silly, serious actions. So they're often like breaking some kind of taboo. So whether that's having a swear word on our, on our first ever banner that the media had to censor out or whether um, that is when a group of people uh, got naked in parliament. Um, and suddenly that also caught the media's attention because, you know, it's this kind of psychological disruption it's sudden it's like catching the media's attention um they can't help themselves but look at it and all of a sudden we're pointing them straight at the climate emergency instead of brexit or whatever else they want to talk about on a regular day um so and these actions they kind of take a serious issue but they they mix it with some kind of humor or always and i think that's really important i'll come back to talk about the creativity a bit more and then there's the mass nonviolent civil disobedience action. So this is where we try and design something which has like as low a barrier to entry as possible, um, but still kind of pushes um, some pushes the disruption through the sheer number of people doing it. So the most common thing that that's ended up being here in the UK is just a large group of people sitting down in the road together um, here in the UK. Um, it's one of the lowest level crimes you can be charged for is disruption of the public highway. So it's like specifically we found like what's the lowest level like fine that someone can get um, and still be committing civil disobedience and breaking some kind of law. And, and 
how how easy is it for anyone of any age to just sit down you know they don't have to learn how to climb on something they don't have to like make a special outfit all, all we're asking them to do is sit down <laughs> and obviously there's trainings that we even for that that we go through with them but um how can we get that low barrier to entry for those large numbers of people and then through that sheer number we create this dilemma because it is this mass group of people rather than this you know classic activisty lefty crowd of protesters it's this massive quite a diverse group of people the police are left with this dilemma and the state are left with this dilemma do we go in and remove these people um, and stop the disruption but then we risk looking too harsh on the general public because they've got the media's attention or do we allow them to continue and therefore allowing them to continue allows other people to feel like oh this is something i could do too and come and join and the disruption continues and so it's really about putting the state into that dilemma situation so we're now after two of these kind of events and it's really important to say this is not like a one-day protest march we actually asked people to take two weeks off work and we did that twice in 2019 Obviously, we've had to change plans with coronavirus, but by the end of 2019, we've got a situation where the police are asking the government to pay for the policing of the protests. And the government are saying, no, you'd pay for the policing of the protests. And the police are saying, no, you pay for it. So we've, got, we've created this tension between an arm of the state and the state, right? And that's where you're going to get to the point where we can start to move into negotiations and start, start to see some actual action. Um, so there's kind of three key parts of an Extinction Rebellion action, I think, that I kind of like analyzed right near the beginning, which is the dis disruption part, which is, you know, that in itself has kind of different parts of how we make that nonviolent civil disobedience work. But it's really about, you know, disruption that is causing the police to have to be, have to make arrests of people. Or, or, or take the decision not to and then allow the disruption to continue. But it's also disrupting the public and putting those people having into like an emotional response. Ah, oh, I'm really annoyed, I'm being disrupted. Oh, but I kind of see why they're doing it because my kids should have a future, right? Or, oh, I don't understand, like I'm just gonna move on. But we're, we're, and, or I don't like them, but they're having to have some kind of response because they're being emotionally disrupted. And that means that the media is focusing on it and the government is paying attention because if you've got a general public who's suddenly being made aware of this and being pissed off, whether they're in favor or not, the government are gonna have to do something because they have to respond in some way to the general public. And then the second is that outreach. So it's how we use that attention through our media outreach, social media, and also to the public that we're disrupting. You know, we always have leaflets. When we used to be just a really small group of people and block a road, we'd always take some biscuits and offer the drivers in the front, do you want a biscuit while you're stuck in traffic? Like try and make, obviously they often wouldn't take it, but always trying to outreach to the people who are directly there as well. And the last thing that really important is the visioning element where we really bring in the creativity um, and vision either the future we want to see or the future that we don't want to see. So although for the majority of people who came and took part in our first big international rebellion um, in London were just asked to come for as long as they could and sit down in the road and they came in small groups of people and that's what they did. Suddenly um, amongst them, you know, floating on top of this crowd of people who were just there sitting in the road was this pink boat which said tell the truth just down the road from the head office of the BBC, the main news outlet. Um, and so th there was our demand, on, you know, in visually showing and messaging to people that, you know, this, the sea levels were rising, that, you know, we needed to tell the truth about this, that who would have thought a boat would be there in London, you know, create all this surreal imagery. And, you know, um, just down the road, there was an orchard of trees put across a bridge and so suddenly rather than this p polluted bridge in the center of London that commuters had to walk across every day to get into their offices in the banking sector that suddenly that every day they were walking through this like orchard of trees and the air pollution had dropped massively and they were you know interacting with the protesters who were who were staying there day after day um, and and all of these kinds of things meant that people who came 
and thought, oh yeah, I'll come and support it, see how it is, or maybe I'll risk getting arrested. Suddenly, they didn't just get arrested once, they came back the next day and said, I'm going to go and sit there again, because I want to hold this place and keep this beautiful space that we've created where people um, can be together. It's really important to say that obviously for every kind of action where there's someone taking a sacrifice there's a there's around eight to ten other people doing loads of other jobs and so extinction rebellion isn't a place where for only you know these people who are willing to risk being arrested there's so many other roles in the organization that go into making those things possible and supporting those people whether that's going and supporting them when they come out the police station in the courts whether that's fundraising for them whether that's doing the media all of these other things and so there's, you know, Extinction Rebellion by, by trying to expand this mass space, it, it has a space for people who want to just give out leaflets and talk to people, but also has a space for people who don't even just want to sit on a road, but like someone in October last year did, went and sat on top of a plane and stopped it taking off for quite a while. So it's oh. this whole spectrum of people can fit into this mass umbrella rather than keeping these like very specific focus things that some other um, campaigns have in the past here in the UK. I heard you might have a picture handy of that uh, big boat. Um, yeah, I could probably get you a picture if people haven't seen it yet. Um, let's see if we can just share the screen. Okay, I can't share it, but may I think I sent it to you guys. Or for All some right, reason. so we'll see if Abby, Abby maybe can share it while we're no, talking. I, I, can, I can share it and you can share it. Something's, I, I can't make Liam my co-host. Okay, that's okay. I had some Zoom problems earlier today, so maybe it's that. All right. Um, yeah, but... No yeah, worries, you, but let's say I read a little bit. You can go and see some images of it. Um, and so you mentioned some of the actions that you guys did. Can you uh, share more of um, like the war stories, some of the more extreme actions that you've personally been uh, part of? The the worst stories? You mean like war stories? Oh, the oh the war stories. Okay, because <laughs> I could also share some bad <laughs> ones that went wrong. No, and uh, go for that too. Um. um yeah so um yeah so the idea the idea with this um this first international rebellion was that we instead of just coming in for one day and going and targeting say a fossil fuel company that were wrong or um a bank that would were funding climate emergency or you know being horrible to someone we decided to create these four five spaces across central London, actually. And they, they all represented our demands to the government. So they were positively visioning the demands that we wanted to see. So that, that first one was tell the truth written across the pink boat, which maybe someone will be able to share. Um, or the second one with all of the trees was actually representing our second demand to act now by halting biodiversity loss and reducing carbon emissions to net zero. And the third was um, this space which was created where people could come and talk to each other about the issue. And that represented our third demand, which is this idea to have a citizens assembly. So one of the really interesting things about Extinction Rebellion is that, um, you know, rather than going out and saying, we've got these specific policies which we think are gonna solve it, um, and we're gonna, you know, also disrupt your day while we're telling you what you should do with your future. We're trying to be slightly more humble, which is that say we're saying, we're gonna disrupt your day because we want your kids to have a future, but we don't actually know how to solve it. We will actually want people to come together and solve it and decide together, rather than these politicians and elites coming up with this, with what you're gonna to have to give up. People will need to come together in a, in a representative group, representative of the population, and deliberate after listening to the experts on the climate science about what policies they want to want to integrate. So rather than as being, you know, specific on any one policy, like say, for example, veganism or wind power, you know, and 
we we're saying actually we want a better democracy to come up with that solution and that's really good for for several reasons one is it's it's not coming across as arrogant saying that suddenly we without the resources or expertise can tell you what to do as a government or as the people but also it doesn't divide our movement there's so many people in our within extinction rebellion that have completely different ideas about the solutions to the climate emergency but what unites them is that something needs to happen now and that it's serious enough that they're willing to take some kind of civil disobedience. So we actually had another action on that third demand um, this weekend. And that action was actually inspired by some of the recent protests in Israel. So we had we did our first socially distanced protest um, as Extinction Rebellion UK on Saturday. And we had people stand um, three meters apart in rows um, outside parliament but also outside some of the um, local government and uh, national assemblies around the UK this weekend and so we're trying to figure out an experiment with that and that was actually inspired by uh, there you can see the pink boat there riding on a sea of people um, yeah it was there for a moment yeah, it's gone now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess um, what what it's really what's really important here is about the how we our actions are trying to, you know, do embody this nonviolent civil disobedience, but without necessarily going and targeting anyone individually and really just drawing attention to the issue through people's willingness to risk being arrested. Um, and then how we outreach that and message that in these creative ways. Thanks Liam. And I wanna ask uh, Yara um, about the movement in Israel. What are the more daring things that the movement in Israel has been able to do? Um, well, the movement in Israel it actually has celebrated a year anniversary just this past week. Uh, we really started last May in 2019. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that in a year we have been able to do some, some actions and get people mobilized and direct action, something that I think we haven't seen in a very long time, um, in, in, at least in the environmental issues, like, we see this a lot in uh, animal rights issues and maybe peace um, and occupation, but we haven't seen it enough in environmental issues. So um, I think one, one of the actions that I can say is blockading the entrance to Bazan um, factories, which is the- um, The oil refineries. Yeah, oil refineries in the Haifa Bay area, which is one of the most polluted area areas in the country, 800,000 people are living there and there's this huge, massive uh, industrial area with petrochemical factories and oil refineries that is just polluting their lives day after day with um, the highest rates of uh, asthma disease in children and there's lung disease and cancer disease. Um, so we blockaded the entrance of uh, one of the entrance of the factory. This was one of our first actions as XR. The, remember I said at the beginning, we started as um, just an actions group that became XR. So this was our actual first XR action. And it, I think what was good about it was not just that we blockaded the entrance and disrupted the, that area. We also got uh, people, um, people involved just um, other other activists who are not interested in blockading but wanted to be there and support so and citizens living in the Haifa Bay area going going through this hell of a life day every day so they also participated and they were standing there with us um, and for a second even blockading together with us and we got to all of the we got all media coverage without even being getting arrested so that was a success um, and I think another, another action that we did 
um, was blockading. We only we don't we don't only do blockades, but it's just to uh, happen to be another example. Um, is blockading a convention that talked about gas and business, uh, sorry, energy and business. Um, and uh, the one, it cost something like 600 shekels to enter. So for us, it was pretty obvious that they didn't want any citizens in this convention, only lobbyists of uh, fossil companies and the Ministry of Energy was there and also uh, some CEOs from different gas companies from abroad that were promoting their business in Israel. So we, we know that Israel is involved. We knew that and know that Israel is involved in some projects of exporting gas to Europe, like I said. So, and we knew that these representatives are going to be there. And we wanted to send the message that gas, not here, not anywhere. Um, we don't want you to drill gas anywhere. It's not just a NIMBY. Um, struggle. So we went there and we blockaded the entrance of the convention and didn't let any of the cars enter. Um, and five, five or six activists were arrested because of that. Um, and also got, got a fine for disrupting the, um, the movement of the cars or something, some kind of uh, invention by the police at that moment. Um, and that got a lot of people um, aware to this issue. So that was also a very good uh, outcome of that. It's not just that it was daring, but it was also for us, it's always about inspiring people and always about letting people know that they, they can be involved and they, sh they should know about this issue. And I'll just give another last example that our first, first action, um, before we even started XR, but we were about to was uh, doing a sit-in in the Noble Energy offices in Israel. Um, we were just about 10 people and we went there and just went into their office with, with uh, the message that we don't want them to keep drilling in our sea, in Mediterranean Sea. We don't want them to have their business here. Um, and we weren't going to leave until they, they stopped drilling. And at, at one point, the CEO of Noble Energy came down and sat across from us while we were sitting. And he was asking, OK, what do you want me to do? So I just looked him in the eyes and I told him, I want you to stop drilling gas. I don't want you to do this. This is for your kids as well. It's not just for me. It's for all of us. And you have to understand. Um, and so we were arrested for that. Um, and Unfortunately, that way, that, that did not get to media coverage. That was when I, um, for, I think for the first time, really realized the connection between uh, the media and the political uh, actors and money because we were uh, granted, uh, we were promised to have an item on Walla site, which is one of the biggest sites in Israel, and it's controlled by... Um, a very powerful person that is very close to our prime minister and our prime minister loves gas and he loves promoting gas. So uh, even though they promised us an item and they were asking for some kind of, in, um, you know, everything, pictures, videos, everything, we did not get any coverage in the end, but we did, did do a live broadcast on Facebook. And this is maybe something that I can recommend. Don't ever give up on live, uh, broadcast on Facebook because th that is your direct connection to people, your people. And I can say that people w that told me this afterwards watched this action live and they were s really inspired and that's what got them to come to our first XR rally um, to get started with XR. So they saw this and they wanted to be part of it even though they didn't know who we are. They just believed in what we did. So don't ever give up on live broadcast. So I have one follow-up question to that and then one more question to Liam and then we're going to open up to uh, questions from uh, the audience. But I just want to ask you, Yara, when hearing the actions that Liam describes, do you feel that in Israel uh, the movement is able to go as radical as they do in the UK? Could you, in theory, send activists to get naked in parliament? Or are we working under different norms here in Israel? And if so, why or what are they? Well, first of all, me and my friends, um, 
went half naked for our campaign in Be'er Sheva a few years ago. Well, it was our backs, but I mean, I think people are, are when they really believe in their um, goal, they will do it. Um, I think there's a, a difference in culture and also tradition of non, um, civil disobedience between the UK and Israel. We don't have that tradition as, as what they have. And um, I wish we had it, but we have more work to do in radicalizing people here and, and helping them be more political in their civil uh, involvement, which is, first of all, not just voting one, once or three times a year in a political process, but um, doing more than that. So we have, we have more, um, more work to do on that point to build this tradition. I think we are like the pioneers of that tradition or part of a pioneer f phase. Um, and I hope that we will be at one point where the UK is, which is very inspiring. Um, but I can say that there is also change, you know, I've been an active, an activist f for the environment for six years and I've seen the change within people. I've seen the change in me. I wasn't, uh, the first action that I was, um, that was proposed to me to do was, uh, dress up like a tree and, and protest outside the building of the Be'er Sheva municipality. And I, w I, I wasn't going to do that. That was so embarrassing for me. And today I do much, much more radical stuff than that. So I think every person needs to go through a process and they need the right framework to help them go through that. And, and I can say just to end this, that there are, there are more and more people that are, that really want to be more involved and are ready to take the risk. And we were, can say that we were planning a big action right before Corona hit us. Um, that we had over 30 people that were ready to to do what it takes and take the, you know, they had the privilege that they could be arrested and, and they were willing to take that risk. And that is something that has never happened yet. So um, I think that shows a change and I see more and more people that want to be involved. So I'm still optimistic about that. Thanks, Sierra. Last question for now, before we open it up, Liam. Give us your take on civil disobedience. We're talking philosophy, yeah? Uh, what is its role in democracy to you? Uh, how far would you take it? What are your red lines? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, sometimes, you know, you kind of get the question, oh, why don't you just vote, you know, these kind of things, and I think, it's, I think um, it's important that you have a more active democracy than that. That To me, that's a kind of passive democracy, right? Just going along to the polling station and then going home and leaving it up to these other people to, to be actively engaged. And particularly when we're in a situation now where we've, you know, time, so time is running out, you know, it's an emergency situation. I think, you know, we need we need to have some action now um, and to be pressuring governments now rather than waiting until, you know, they, they ask us politely whether we'd like them to do something about it. And, and you know, so it's, I think it's about that active role in democracy. Um, and I think um, the, you know, there's so many examples in history you know, I think we we grew up, at least here in the UK, and it, kind of following on from what Yara was saying, it really is cult culturally specific. I think a lot of civil disobedience, a lot of the way that we creatively design stuff, our actions here in the UK as Extinction Rebellion is is responding to the political and the cultural, um, you know, society that we're in here. And like when we're designing those taboo actions or what's going to psychologically disrupt people, it's about how it's going to play in the media here and so it's really important to work with artists and designers when you are planning a, a some kind of civil disobedience where you are to think about the culture it is there so a lot of the the art that we've used here in the uk directly relates to things like the suffragette movement for women's vote here in the uk directly relates to uk punk scene um 
you know, it, it plays on these things. Um, and the wording that we use has been very deliberate so that we can get outside of the left wing bubble or just being seen as a protest and by using specific wording and make, making ourselves multicolored and very colorful, we've tried to create this thing which, which looks attractive to a whole range of people here in the UK and maybe not enough yet in the UK, like it's, a, it's an experiment, it's an ongoing process to really welcome as many people as possible, but to really get outside of that bubble, the art and the culture has been really important, but directly related to the culture here as to what will work. Um, so, but to go back to the question, what, um, what is it that you're specifically asking about civil disobedience? Like what? What would you not do? What would we not do? Well, to, to call yourself part of Extinction Rebellion, you have to just meet our 10 principles and values, which you can find on our website. And the main thing is that we're strategically committed to nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, partly because a lot of the research that we've looked at shows that in over the last um, hundred years of different social movements, um, nonviolent civil disobedience has been more effect, more likely to be effective. Um, and it relies on a certain percentage of the population being actively involved and a, and a much larger percentage being behind something happening, which is starting to happen in the UK. The passive support for something to happen on the climate emergency is growing and growing right now with the school strikes and Extinction Rebellion. Um, but we need much more people to continue to be an active support. Whereas we, if you, you know, with some kind of violent civil disobedience, it isn't, you know, we're not here to say, be on some moral high ground here to say that, you know, no one else should be doing that. Um, but strategically to do that, you basically rely on being supplied with resources, i.e. some kind of armaments from some outside state to win. And that's just not, you know, a strategically great road to go down. Um, plus, we get the benefit of all the people who are principally and morally nonviolent um, coming and being part of this as well. Um, so it, it just allows it to be a much safer, more open space. Um, so I guess for Extinction Rebellion, that's, that's a line that we're not going to cross um, there. But, you know, this is nonviolent civil disobedience. So this does still mean, you know, breaking the law. And this does mean that for some people, um, you know, they've super glued themselves to um, like that boat that you saw earlier or chained themselves to trucks. Um, this, this does mean damaging property, whether that's spray painting on government buildings or whether it's, you know, smashing the windows of the headquarters of Shell um, oil company in London. These, these are all things that, um, you know, a wide, there's a whole wide range of nonviolent civil disobedience tactics that you can use that include those kind of things. And we're starting to explore more and more other kinds, especially with the coronavirus situation. Um, so we're looking now into whether there's some kind of debt strike or tax strike um, and these other kinds of nonviolent civil disobedience that are less about us being physically somewhere and more about as um, you know, withdrawing participation in the system in another way. Thanks, Liam. I'd like to open up to questions from um, the audience. I have a question from uh, Marcella Simoni. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Hi, um, can you see me? Maybe not. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you. Your video is not on. Yeah, I'm sorry. So I think I'm going to hi to all of you. Thank you for um, this most interesting discussion. Um, I wrote the question a few, um, I would say, 10 minutes ago. So maybe I don't know if it's still in context. But I was wondering how um, Israeli environmental uh, civil, society, civil society activism deals with the one belt, one road um, initiatives and mm, inevitable environmental bad 
consequences that that is going to have. For example, the transformation or the rebuilding of the Ashkelon port or the uh, connection between Ashkelon and Eilat and so on. And so whether what kind of actions are um, planned or what is the thought about it? Thank you. So I, I don't think that that that, that issue is uh, is on the agenda um, uh, of the um, Israeli environment community, um, although I can really see the linkages that you're that you're making. Um, uh, I, I, you know the 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 Israeli environment community, um, for the most part, is is focused on uh, 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 on the on the one hand. Uh, uh, protection of open spaces, you know, organizations like the Society of Protection of Nature in Israel, or the urban environment organizations like um, the Israel Union for Environmental Defense. Um, the, that, that sort of globalize, that, that, that globalization of the of Chinese industry uh, that, that you're talking about, that, that I don't think that um, uh, that, that has uh, been a, an, an issue adopted by the environment community, but interestingly enough, um, the you know the American government just basically stopped Israel from uh, allowing a Chinese company to build uh, the next large desalination plant in uh, Sorek, uh, but that's nothing to do with um, uh, environmental issues or um, or democracy issues. It's all about uh, uh, the politics between China and the United States. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, more questions from. I know there was one way early on uh, from Eli Abidor about activism. I have a question. <clears throat> Hello. Yeah. Hello, my name is Itai Siegel from Kibbutz Gezer, Israel. Hi. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this. It's um, very wonderful and touching. I feel that um, the whole situation that we are in right now, everything is so intertwined. Um, if it's the governments, and in my point of view, there are, are also a lot of... Um, background companies and people that are leading agendas, if they are political, financial, social. And in order for there to be a real change, a real dramatic shift needs to happen in the way our governments are run, in our lifestyle, in the things that we do and day to day. And a, an organization that brings everybody together, all of the organizations, environmental, social, everything, all of the organizations, only real change can happen. So my question is to the panelists, um, do you agree with what I'm saying? And if so, the direction that all of these organizations are going, is it possible to achieve these goals of change um, in the time that we have? Liam, do you want to take that one? Um, I can try and talk, talk about it. Um, are you, I guess, are you talking about um, how we build a movement of movements, how movements work together. Is that what you're trying to, to ask that, about? That point also, but also like right now, our political situation in Israel, everybody's saying that BB is corrupt and everything, but it's not just BB, it's the whole government and the whole organizations that move the whole world right now, the world economy that leads people to hate. And that's how they control everything and keep it, keep the situation where they are in control. Yeah. Their, their economy going. So it's two points actually. Um, yeah, well, um, I, think, I think we do, we're more and more understanding, um, you know, in, 
in the environmental movement that this is a wider issue and definitely a lot of the people that um, set up Extinction Rebellion wanted to um, to make sure that this was about a wider the wider context and the wider system is one of the reasons that our third demand is a, really about changing the way our democracies run right and giving um, more power to to ordinary citizens through um, things like citizens assemblies which are things that have actually already been run in several countries now um, to much much good effect um, and I think the you know the way that you know coming together as as different movements um, is always going to be difficult and and many of the attempts that Extinction Rebellion has made haven't worked out exactly right and it but I think it's really important to for me to say that right now we know that the situation is really dire right maybe it's the worst um, problem that human beings have had to try and solve and it really affects everyone this is something that suddenly everyone is affected by this thing and so for, I think for that reason it's it's a good opportunity to bring people together um, but also it means that we don't we don't know what's going to work yet so I think we need as many people as possible trying something. And, and that's where it's really important to just get involved in something, whether it's Extinction Rebellion or something else. I don't really care as long as you're doing something active, either that's donating something to it, whether that's going and talking to people about the climate emergency, whether that's organizing a protest on the street. Um, and all of these different things can work together in what I see as an ecology, ecology of different strategies and tactics. Um, within a movement of movements that's all striving towards that same vision. We don't all need to be doing the same thing. So one example here in the UK is that we have this group of lawyers called Plan B, and they have the resources and the skills to take the government to court over environmental issues, things that Extinction Rebellion don't have. But Extinction Rebellion has this big group of people who are able to get arrested and change the national conversation about the climate emergency. And of course, that impacts how the courts um, and the juries in those courts and the judges in those courts are gonna are gonna take those verdicts. And so we saw after um, these big Extinction Rebellion protests shifted public opinion, when Plan B took the government to court over airport expansion, they won, and they, you know, the court said you can't expand this airport, this fossil fuel intensive thing. And so these different tactics can be working together, and we don't know which one's gonna work, but we need as many people to be trying something now. So, so at, at Ecopeace, I mean, we also take it, you know, we, we have a, a much narrower focus. We're, we really are focused on the conflict. We're focused on Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. And we're trying to reach out to uh, uh, actually not, not your expected left wing. We're trying to reach out to the silent majority and use the environment um, uh, you know, through a people-to-people -people approach of, of literally you know, taking tens of thousands of people to look at the results, look at what conflict has led to. Um, uh, and, you know, we've taken tens of thousands of local residents along the Jordan River on, from the Israeli side, from the Palestinian side, uh, from the Jordanian side, to look at a sewage canal. And most people are shocked that, that that's the River Jordan. And um, even though they might live in that neighborhood because the river is the border, because the river has been fenced and because the river has been mined, out of sight, out of mind, we've brought it back uh, uh, to attention. And then um, uh, by uh, undertaking, you know, sort of research, um, try to present solutions and, uh, and speak to the self-interest of each side so that you know, we're able to mobilize residents of Beichan who are generally very right wing um, would not be interested or involved in activities together with Palestinians or Jordanians, but because there is a common interest that they see um, that is affecting their lives, they're willing to get involved and they're willing to, um, you know, even the mayor of, uh, of Beichan jump into the Jordan River with Palestinian and, and Jordanian mayors, which was unthinkable. Uh, for uh, uh, the mayor when uh, you know this effort started, um, so so you know I think all of us have a really important role to play. But I think it's important to understand that it's a building block. That 
Um, if we all try to do everything, um, we're, we're not going to succeed. Um, I, that's why I, I like uh, this session. It's trying to you know, have learnings from the different strategies uh, from different organizations. So Combatants for Peace has a, a, a very particular strategy. Um, Extinction Rebellion has uh, a, a very particular strategy. Echo Peace has a, a, a different uh, a but particular strategy. But, th but there is a commonality in it, and that is rejecting the status quo um, uh, uh, in the effort uh, you know, to, to bring a change um, uh, to the forefront. I don't believe that you know, uh, revolutions, uh, a revolution is going to come out. Um, I, I do think that uh, although change um, uh, is slow and incremental, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, that is how the change is going to take place. Um, I, I don't think that, it, it, that there sadly is a watershed event, um, even COVID, you know, you, you'd think that the world would react very differently uh, uh, to the crisis and would, would see much more cooperation. On the contrary, we see so many um, uh, actions of, of, of nationalism taking place in the midst of a, of a crisis, which actually requires more cooperation than ever uh, to overcome it. Um, so so, so I, I think that um, uh, uh, you know, the networking and, and the joint learning um, is critical uh, uh, to, you know, to the success of, of change making um, but but that uh, uh, but but it's the it's a complementary effort, and, and it's not uh, just one single organisation that's going to bring the change needed. Thanks, Gidon. Uh, we have a question from Michael. Uh, there's two, but let's do your first question for now. Do you want to come up? Yeah, sure. So, hi, my name is Michael from uh, Tel Aviv. I've also worked many years in uh, both on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Hi, Gidon. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and also on environmental uh, issues. And I established an NGO on that. And today I also work in the Adova Institute for Environmental Studies, um, which also has Palestinians and Jordanians as well as Israeli students. So I had two questions because I'm incredibly impressed by what XR did uh, beginning in Britain and then around the world, and also by um, Extinction Rebellion in, in Israel. And like the, about a year ago, I, um, I just joined a demonstration that was in Tel Aviv by, um, on climate change, which was, I think, mostly organized, not just, but all, mostly by Extinction Rebellion. And I, I've been to dozens and dozens of demonstrations on the environment and on, on the conflict, and I've never seen the kind of energies and the amount of young people, like high school students, in a demonstration and the kind of reactions from the public, like I saw in that demonstration. So, you know, something that Extinction Rebellion is doing in the messaging um, is right. And my question is, um, and that really relates to, to a lot of frustration that myself and other activists have, both on the, on the conflict, um, for conflict um, um, issues, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, so my question is that um, that uh, in you, we can say in the last decade, the Israeli government and right-wing elements, and to a certain extent, the, the media has played along, have managed to very successfully brand um, organizations such as the uh, Lochamim Shalom, uh, Combatants for Peace, and other organizations, which at the beginning had a lot of public sympathy and basically brand them as just lefties, uh, you know, traitors, and at the best, uh, like elitists who are not connected to the basic uh, interests of, you know, um, of the Israeli public. And they've done that pretty well. So um, um, many of these organizations today are, are pretty marginalized and, you know, having tried so many tactics, some nothing seems to work to break that the sort of barriers among the Israeli public and anything that has to do with uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I wonder what, um, uh, what we can learn today um, as political activists on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and ending the occupation from the, what I see as the relative uh, success of Extinction Rebellion um, in reaching a very broad public, uh, again, beginning in Britain and then spreading through the world. 
um, like these tactics that Liam talked about, positive imaging and um, creativity. And I know combatants have tried that, like with the theater of the oppressed during their demonstrations, but it just, it hasn't worked in the, you know, in the, in the end. Um, so that's one question. And the other question is regarding the environmental organizations, which are also very marginal in Israel. And again, how, what can we learn from Extinction Rebellion that would work in the Israeli context and Israeli culture? Thanks. Let's stick with the first question for now uh, uh, to Liam. And I, 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 if it's okay with you, Michael, I want to even narrow it in more. Liam, if you were to workshop some hardcore activism ideas for the peace movement here in Israel and Palestine, what kinds of activities would you envision? Yeah, I mean, let's let's book a workshop. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it all right now, and I think I think we'd need a lot more two-way dialogue because this totally relates to, as I said before, like the creativity totally relates to the culture. Um, and the politics where you are and so i actually um was um traveling recently and met some other groups in other countries and we did a q a but it was it was a q a in two directions you know there was a chance for me to ask it was actually in turkey what was the situation in turkey like the political cultural situation the legal situation and we had to brainstorm how to come up with a creative protest that you could get away with doing somewhere where if you hold up a placard you will be arrested in within a few minutes um and so that was a two-way dialogue there but i think i think the big thing here is extinction rebellion was a very clear experiment we we had the the issue is like getting people to face this climate and ecological emergency um through non-violent civil disobedience and we you know people were empowered to go out and try things and experiment with that and just take action and the language that we used we tried to use as simple language as possible that people could really just easily understand what we were talking about and um when we had meetings it was really to discuss how we were going to act and what was the work that we were going to do to get something done rather than to debate for hours and hours which was going to be what exactly our demand should be which policy should we be advocating for um, over another all of these things which actually end up splitting your movement and your energy rather than bringing you together under under these broad um, simple language um, demands and messaging that we're putting out there and and using these colorful colorful flags and um, bright pink boats that again were really simple it wasn't that we devised a whole play that explained sea level rising that was going on although i think one of those was performed somewhere in the protest um the thing that the newspapers all around the world took a picture of was something really simple it was just a boat that was bright pink and it said tell the truth and people could understand that you know they didn't have to have an academic degree to get it and so as much as possible, it was trying to, it's trying to do that, focusing on, okay, let's just experiment with this, try and do something, take action rather than continually debate. And it's interesting to see, you know, the media did, did originally and still does, you know, c condemn us as left wing or whatever, but we still got on the, one of the first protests we ever did, the main, one of the more right wing tabloid newspapers the picture that they used of our demonstration was a placard which just said nonviolent and had our logo. And I thought that was, that was amazing compared to some of the pictures that actually got into the more left wing or broadsheet newspapers that this tabloid right wing newspaper, the only image they used made it immediately clear that this was a nonviolent movement to anyone right at the beginning of when we were launching. I think it shows that, you know, the message was was colorful enough and simple enough that it could be could be getting across in in different mediums and you know we didn't we never we release our press releases to all newspapers you know we make sure that we really are setting up interviews even with the right wing disc jockeys on the radio who want to run a full on campaign against us we'll go and talk to them and talk to their listeners about their kids future 
Right. Yeah, Thanks. the actual um, uh, uh, march that you were speaking about, uh, Michael, uh, the climate ma last year's climate march, is an interesting example of, of the ability of the environment community to work together. And I think that's a, that is something quite extraordinary. Um, the fact that you don't know who was the organizer is a reflection of that. So that, that really was an organ that really was the effort of uh, probably some 20 different environmental organizations that um, was really led by Megama Yuka um, that uh, had initiated the climate march earlier, but really reduced its profile so that all environmental organizations uh, would feel comfortable to take place, to take part. So um, uh, I think a unique aspect of the environment community um, is I, I think its ability to uh, reduce ego and, uh, and try to create a as broad a coalition that, that, that it can. And, and indeed that march was a tremendous success of positive uh, energy because so many different organizations from the environment community were uh, uh, really put down their ego to make sure that everyone could participate. All right. I must have at least 10 more questions that I wrote in advance that I didn't get to today. And at least 10 more that I thought of while I heard you all talking. I imagine uh, uh, the rest of the participants feel the same way, uh, which is a good place to end uh, wanting to keep the conversation going. And so uh, we uh, would probably want to follow this up at some point, at least I do. Um, so thank you very much, Liam, Idan, and Yara for uh, sharing your thoughts and time with all of us and, and, and inspiring us and for the work that you do. Just before we end, I want to turn to Yara one last time and ask if any of the participants here is inspired to uh, start a revolution. What do they do? Who do they, who do they approach? Where do they join? <laughs> um, yeah, they can um, approach me. I can leave my contact info in the chat and you can contact me if you want to join XR or other groups um, in Israel and be more active than for sure. Just send me a message and um, join the, the rebellion because we need more people for sure. Um, I'll write it down now. Thanks, Yara. Uh, so everyone watch for that in the chat box in a moment. And as we've been concluding all these conversations during the COVID period with a wish to everyone uh, for Sakha, Briut, and health. And as always, Shalom, Salam, and peace to everyone here. Thank you. Tada, Laila Tov. <laughs> I've been seeing a lot of people saying that, thank you, young people, but some of the people that have been arrested the most times are over 70 years old in the UK. This is really not a young people's movement. It's just to make sure people understand that. Um, but ta-da. <laughs> thank ta you. Ta-da. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye, all. Good night.